Now this evening, we want to try to say some things that will help us visualize, conceptualize, really bring home to us what the kingdom of God is like. And um, I give you one other verse to help you with that, and I referred to it last time, it's 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And this evening we have to do something that's really pretty hard to do, and that is to talk about the nature of God and the nature of the spiritual world of which he is a part. You see, until we have that in our vision, our faith is going to be hindered. You know, you can have a vision that doesn't change your vision. And many people have had a genuine experience of Christ, but they're still haunted by a morbid vision of reality. Let me just illustrate that quickly by a reference to a story that you know well from the Scripture, and that's the story of Peter. You remember Jesus said to him, Who do you say that I am? And he said, You are the Anointed One. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And then Jesus said to him, Simon, this is a revelation from God. It is God that has shown you this. And no more, almost as immediately as he had said that, he began to talk about how he was going to go up to Jerusalem and be crucified. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, you remember. And at that point, Jesus said to him, you savor the things that be of man and not the things that be of God. Now see, what had happened to Peter was he had had a vision, but it was still captivated by the old vision that told him what reality is like. You see, I have a vision of reality. My vision of reality is manifested by what I am ready automatically to assume in my action. That's my vision of reality. What I'm automatically going to assume in action shows what my vision is. And the position we are in as fallen human beings is that we normally take the physical world to be reality. And that's why there's a constant struggle. You remember in the great faith chapter in Hebrews 11, it speaks about how Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible. Isn't that a good verse? <laughs> now, you see, that was Moses' vision. It wasn't just a vision he had had, it was the vision that had him. He endured as seeing him who was invisible. And uh, Paul speaks the same way in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, 16, 18, when he talks about how our outward person is perishing, but the inward person is being renewed day by day while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. See, faith is essentially the knowledge and vision of the invisible world. That's faith. Faith is not a wild leap. Faith is confidence in the reality of the invisible world. And see, then that, that informs everything that we do. Once again, from Hebrews 11. He that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him. See, seeking. Seeking means we base our life on this vision. We're seeking it. And of course the promise is, if with all your hearts you seek me, ye shall probably find me. <laughs> is that the way that reads? How's that, what does that say? Surely, surely, absolutely. 
If with all your heart you seek me, ye shall surely find me. So, as we think now about this invisible world, we're going to have to use a little bit of language that may seem strange to you because it's not the language of theology. We have to talk about things like energy and matter and things of that sort. And to begin, I wish you just, if you have a piece of paper, just write down there that familiar little equation, E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared. Now, the, it was a, it's a part of the human enterprise on earth to find out about as much, of, uh, uh, as much about reality as we can. That's the domain that God has given to human beings. And our friend Albert Einstein uh, worked this out. Uh, I have a theory about the history of science. I actually have done a lot of work in the history of science. And uh, the history of science, I think, is one of the areas where God continues to work constantly. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the history of science, you will often have the impression these people are walking backwards into the future. They're sleepwalking. Uh, it's very like what you see in the book of Acts, isn't it, you know, when you have these guys and gals standing around sort of waiting for things to happen, and sure enough they do, but they're always being thrust beyond themselves, in the same way in science. Now that little equation, E equals mc squared, says the energy of, uh, that energy of a certain amount of matter is equal to the mass of the matter times the square of the speed of light. The C stands for a constant. I won't keep you long on this, but do try to hang with me just a moment. Now, you can understand that uh, that's a pretty large figure for even a very small amount of mass because uh, what, what's the speed of light? 586,000 miles a second. 186,000. I had it a little faster there than it was supposed to go. I just went faster than the speed of light. 186,000 miles. That's still a big one. Now square that. That's a, that's a rather large number, isn't it? And then if you've, got a, if you've got a piece of matter the size of a ballpoint pen, you've got a huge amount of energy. Now see, human beings are interested in that equation because they think they've got the matter and they want the energy. Right? So they look at the right-hand side of the equation. But you have to think bigger than that. And you have to understand that God in creation really understood this equation already. And when he created the worlds, out of his infinite energy he produced matter. Now you have to think how big a God would be who could throw off this thing we call the material universe and still have lots of gas left. <laughs> I mean, you just think about our sun, 90 million miles away. And thank goodness it's that far away, right? Uh, because of the power that's in that. Now you, you see, you begin, now, I, I just want to move quickly back to biblical imagery. So one of the pictures of God is a consuming fire. Now where did they get that idea? They got it from their experience. You remember uh, Exodus 19. You remember when God comes down on Sinai. What does Sinai do? Smokes, burns, right. See, it's just chugging with energy because God has come down on it. One of the bits of language in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, our God is a consuming fire. Where did they get that? They got that from their experience of God coming out of the heavens. When James and John said to Jesus, Lord, would you like for us to call fire down out of heaven? You see, they were talking within a tradition in which that was repeatedly done. In many, many ways. Where did the fire come to light the sacrifice in the temple? Out of heaven. 
Where did the fire come that consumed the covenant sacrifices before Abraham? Out of heaven. Where did the fish and biscuits come from that Jesus produced? Out of heaven. Are you beginning to see something here? You see, we don't have a little God. We don't have a little God struggling with matter. We have a God of immense reality in which there is a little thing called the physical universe. See? And Jesus, the Logos, is at the heart of the whole creative process. What are we talking about? We're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about the kingdom of God. I used to have a colleague that would say to me, now Dallas, if Jesus had turned that water into wine, the energy released would have melted the pots. As if somehow anyone who could turn water into wine couldn't take care of the pots. <laughs> It'd be okay. You know. Same, you know, you hear people say, oh, that stuff about Joshua praying and the sun and the moon stopping. Why, well, it would throw everything out of, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If you can do that, you can probably handle the rest. You know, you hear people talking about, oh, how could there be a place called heaven with streets of gold? Don't worry about it, you know. I mean, just look around you at the world that actually exists. Anyone could manage that, could manage some streets of gold, don't you think? Yes, indeed. He can do it. And now, that's the God that lies back of everything. Now, what am I talking about here this evening? I'm talking about the kingdom of God as a basis for death to self. Are you feeling any better about death to self already? See, because death to self really means abandonment of yourself to this great life. This great eternal life which is God. The kingdom of God basically consists of the Trinity. And upon that, all of created order the angelic realm, for example, is a part of the kingdom of God. And it's a kind of a sad thing that angels have gotten so trivialized recently, but I'm willing to pay that price to have them back on the scene. <laughs> As you know, one of the main names of, G of God in the Old Testament is Lord of what? Lord of hosts. Who are the hosts? The angels. The army of God, as you see. And that's an important part. Of course, nature is the kingdom of God also. If we had time this evening, uh, I would love to just work through the last of the Psalms. And if you have time to look through Psalm 145 through 150 and just look at what it says about nature and about all of the forces of nature, all of those are the kingdom of God. Now, I have a feeling that here on earth some of them have been twisted and distorted by the presence of evil. And Paul seems to suggest that all of creation is groaning, waiting for what? Say that again. The manifestation of? The sons and daughters of God. Now, you remember what I said to you last time, that God wants all of us to become the kind of people that he can empower to do what we want to do? That's what that verse is talking about. Hmm. And of course, human beings are ready to take it on. Right? We have people here that, uh, in this Southern California that study earthquake faults, you know. And of course, they're 
They're always thinking about how they could manage to control those things. See, that's the nature of the human being. The human being is made to fit into this vast kingdom of God and to act with that kingdom. And in that respect, you see, the individual human being shares the infinite expectation that is in God himself. That is why, from the human point of view, we are guilty of such hubris, of such arrogance, if you wish, of such a readiness to just, uh, look, you know, if we could run the whole physical universe, we'd do it in a moment. Isn't that right? We do it, just say, where is the control panel? <laughs> and we'll go for it. And, and that's built in, you see, to the way God has built us. Because he, who is infinite creative will, has placed in each of us the will to be creative, to create good. And we all desire to do that. So you have a little child, they want to make things, don't they? They want to create things. And the next thing they want to do them is give them to you. Right? Isn't that right? Yeah, it's a little child. And I still have some strange looking items <laughs> in one of my drawers that my children made at school. You see, that's the human being. It wants to fit in to this kingdom. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the kingdom of God as the basis for death to self. You see, what Jesus tells us about God is that this is a good place for us to be. Among other things, he tells us that we never have to do what is wrong in order to be safe and to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in our lives. And that's, a, that's a, another thing. We don't have to manage our own lives. We don't have to be happy. Do you feel a great weight go off of you there? I mean, <laughs> you've got to be happy. This, the, one of the standard things I tell my classes in ethics is try to find something to do in life bigger than being happy. And some years ago I had a little breathless thing come up and say, you mean I really don't have to be happy? No, you don't have to be happy. And above all, you don't have to manage it so that you become happy. See, the best moralists have realized that the task is to be worthy of happiness, to be worthy of it, and to leave it to God to arrange for whatever happiness and whenever happiness that would come our way. Now, I need to take you to a passage or two in the Bible, and I, I wish I could take you to a lot more than I can this evening, but let's look at Deuteronomy 8 for just a moment. I want to tie this now right back into fasting because I know that we've recently had a good experience in this congregation with fasting. And I want to talk to you about fasting as an illustration of participating in the life of God. So look at Deuteronomy 8 with me for just a few moments here. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 is a kind of rehearsal of what God had done uh, with the Israelites in the, in the time of wandering in the wilderness. Uh, and um, it also incidentally becomes a teaching about fasting. And I'm going to fit fasting in now with what I've just been, you know, E equals MC squared. We're going to fit fasting in with that. So now here in, uh, in Deuteronomy 8, all of the com commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land. See, the commandments of God are always instructions on how to live in the kingdom of God. How to live from the infinite resources of God. And if we will learn that, that will set a hedge around us. 
And we will know the goodness of rightness because this is God's kingdom that's being expressed. Verse 2, you shall remember all the way the Lord your God led you in the wilderness those 40 years that he might humble you. What does humble mean? It means so that he could get you to where you did not trust in yourself. that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, there's something really important here about God's relation to us that I need to say and it may shake you up a little bit. Because you might say, well, didn't God know already? He knows everything. To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Let me tell you that God chooses sometimes not to know things. Think about it. Now this is not a threat against his omniscience. He can know anything he wants to know. But if he doesn't want to know something, he cannot know it. Right? And in his relationships to his people, he often chooses not to know. So when he came in the garden and said, where are you, Adam? It was because he didn't know and he wanted Adam to tell him. Now, the reason we have to talk about that is because of what we're going to come to in just a moment about why it is that God does not make himself obvious. But just park that for the moment. Let me go ahead. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, food alone. Bread there doesn't mean bread, it means food but by every word, everything, including bread, that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Look at the next verse. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. How many of you have a 40-year-old coat? Clothing wears out. Why didn't the clothing wear out? Because E equals MC squared. What was manna? Does anyone know what the word manna means? What is it? Manna means what is it? So go out and gather another basket of what is it? May I tell you what manna was? Manna was the word of God in a tangible form. And it goes right in there with your clothing which doesn't, doesn't wear out. And your foot does not swell. Now that's an interesting phrase. It may have referred to the fact that while they were walking all over this terrible land, their feet did not get sore. It may refer to the fact that their shoes grew with their feet. Either way you take it. If you know what that land looks like, and you can imagine walking around that in for, you would expect to have your feet swell in some sense, wouldn't you? But because God directly dealt with their feet and their shoes and their clothing and the manna, they suffered no lack. See, that is the presence of the kingdom of God as it comes into human life. The loaves and the fishes I've already mentioned, that's just another illustration. The loaves and the fishes, how were they multiplied? 
They were multiplied by the direct power of God coming into those loaves and fishes until they had baskets full left over. Now there's another side to this that's not so happy sometimes. You remember in Acts 5 there's a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias and Sapphira fell crosswise of the power of God. You remember the story, I trust, is simply the story of two people who wanted to be known as giving to the community where everyone was giving everything they had. And so they sold a piece of land and kept back part of it. Now, think now about this in the context of death to self. Isn't that a beautiful illustration of what is not death to self? See, they, they well, why did they keep it back? Well, see, that's that old self. That old self that says, yes, I must run the world. I have to make it work. God is not going to provide for me. I must provide for me. See, when you begin to turn loose, you risk and you rest and you die, then you turn loose control. Not in the sense that you do nothing, but in the sense that you abandon what you do to God. That's very important to understand the difference there. Now, Ananias and Sapphira were perfectly free to keep back part. God did not require that they give everything. But they stepped into a situation where they were pretending to be something they were not. Now, see, that also, that, see, that's just an exact expression of a failure to die to self. When we pretend to be what we are not. Because, you see, when we do that, we are managing our lives from our point of view rather than turning those lives over to God. You know, one of the things, one of the great gifts of the community of Jesus is that we really can let anyone know who we are. We really can lay that down. Now, Ananias and Sapphira fell crosswise, if you wish, of the wires of the kingdom of God. And they were killed. They just fell down dead. And that's an illustration, you see, of the presence of the kingdom. Now, we may be thankful that the voltage isn't as high in our congregations. Here's another illustration, 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is about the Lord's Supper. And do you realize that 1 Corinthians 11 presents a picture where people were actually dying from the Lord's Supper? What if word got out that people were dying here from the Lord's Supper? Well, that was the quality of the power that was flowing in those earlier symptoms. And, you know, we don't say they're perfect. They weren't perfect, were they? I mean, we all know that the, even right after the baptism of the Spirit at Pentecost, they were not perfect. It isn't a matter of perfection. It's a matter of our faith. See, it's a matter of the faith, the vision that we have that counts on God being present in these ways that are dangerous. They're dangerous. And uh, the, the uh, presence of God in his redeemed people is so great that people can actually die of it. Now you remember that one of the sayings about God is that no man shall see God and live. The power of God is a dangerous thing. And we need to understand that because, you see, in our weakness of faith, when we are out there trying to acknowledge, trying to risk, trying to rest, trying to die, it's our vision of the greatness of God that will sustain us in it. 
See, and you think of all the details of your life, or I think of all the details of my life. It may be that some huge business transaction is afoot, and all sorts of things could go wrong. That's where you want to remember what kind of a God it is that's running the universe. That's where we want to recall that we can trust that God, that we can release it into his hands and ask him to glorify himself in what's being done.